in the Delta area of Mississippi. With stores, it's inequitable and unfair. Appreciate it. Babe. very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, our county chairman, Marshall Hanley, Mr. President, I found that all the buttons had my brother Teddy's picture on them. I told him it was too late for him to get in this campaign. He gave me his slogan, which he put on a paper. The candidate's ready, it's not Bobby, but Teddy. Which I, <laughs> but I thought it was going well, my campaign. Especially when I was out in California and I received a telephone call from George Hamilton. He asked for my daughter's telephone number. <laughs> I'd I had a request to appear at a certain university in one of the uh, primary states in which I'm involved. The, the student body wrote, president wrote me an interesting letter which I thought I'd pass on to you. He said he 
he thought my appearance might liven things up. He th said, things are so dull out here that when we take LSD, we see Lawrence Welk. bad though, was it? <laughs> but I'm uh, pleased to be here and I'm, I'm going to uh, give a, a speech and then I, of course at home, is clear. But abroad and at home, it seems to me that critical questions still remain. What kind of help and how much shall we give to the undeveloped nations of the world? What kind of policy shall we forge in order to keep the peace? What will our relationship be to the nations of Europe, the nations of Africa, the nations of Asia, even if almost two billion dollars. Uh. I think that we're, we should move toward a uh, professional army as much as possible. I think that uh, I agree with President Pusey and with others that uh, the drafting, ending of the deferments in the precipitous way that they have been for graduate students is going to cause anarchy uh, over the period of this. Uh, but while the uh, war goes on and the conflict takes place and people are killed, I think that uh, the uh, there that there should be as few deferments as possible and that we should have a lottery system and that all should be treated equally. And that means I think that we should start with the youngest and one of the deferments that I would begin to end would be student deferments. Did I just lose you to Hubert Humphrey? <laughs> Now, but the fact is, I, I think, uh, I'll tell you why I think so, but secondly, I think that also I'm, I mean, I think that th these are important questions and, uh, and I know it's very controversial and I've talked to other universities about it and it's not, particu it's not a popular position, but I, uh, it's what my position is and so we're gonna have to accept it on that basis. I suppose there are gonna be other positions that I'll take that won't be pleasing to you, but I'll try to talk to you as I, the way I see them. I think first, uh, and let me explain why I think about student deferments, if I can, just for a minute. I think that uh, the burden of the war for the Tet Offense have been carried by the poor and by minority groups. Uh, there are a lot of people across the United States who couldn't go to a university and can't go to a college for one reason or another, or decided that they wouldn't go to a college and were going into some other business, so that they were called and they are drafted and they are sent to Vietnam. Now. Uh, the fact is that the poor people, the poor part of our population, only 10% of the United States is Negro, and yet up to the Tet Offensive, and I haven't seen the latest statistics, but up to the Tet Offensive, more than 20% of those who were killed and wounded in Vietnam were Negroes. But you look over the student body here, and how many Negroes, how many black people do you see? It's not 10% of, of the student body here. President Kennedy was president. The problems are entirely different. Their relationship with the Soviet Union is entirely different. The relationship of NATO to uh, the uh, uh, Warsaw Bloc is going to be entirely different. It's changed drastically and dramatically after the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962. And we can't just say that the policy, this policy was effective and, and productive in the 1950s and therefore we're going to continue the same policy in the 1970s. They're going to be more independent of the United States. They don't need the umbrella of the United States. If you think back on our own period of revolution, these countries want to trade with us, they want to work with us. We can establish an As I say, I would, uh, as I've said before, I think we've taken a step uh, toward uh, trying to find a peaceful solution of the uh, war in Vietnam. I made it very clear steps that I to bring that, conf that conflict to the conference table. Uh, I've outlined them at various times over the period of the last several years. I still feel them. I think that taking a step and took an, an important step last Sunday night 
And I think all of our efforts and support should be to try to uh, bring that conference, that, that agonizing war to the conference table. And I don't think anything further I can say would be very helpful. Well, let me say, put it in terms so that, because this is a delicate time, and the North Vietnamese have said that they were going to meet with the United States, so I'm not, I don't want to say anything other than what I've, tell you what I've said in the past, which is uh, uh, that there, are, that I think that when you have negotiations, you have to be prepared to give, and they have to be prepared to give. Uh, that uh, they, uh, we cannot, as I've said in the past, permit an outside force or power to dominate and control South Vietnam, and they will not permit a government to exist in South Vietnam controlled and propped up by American military force. And I've also said as, uh, as, uh, that uh, all of elements within South Vietnam, even those who are adversaries, will have to play some role in the future political process of South Vietnam. What that role will be, the form that it will take, will be decided and determined at the negotiating table. But those are certain truths which, in my judgment, must be faced, faced up to. I've written a book called To Seek a New World, which I've laid out in a, uh, uh, what I think about Vietnam and what, I think you can get it at a cheap edition now. So, all right, there. That gentleman behind you. You play basketball? <laughs> Well, how tall are you? How tall are you? Six eight. Six eight. Oh, what do I think about that? I tell you the truth, that's the first time anybody's asked me that question. Uh, uh, can I just tell you a little story? That President Kennedy was in intelligence. Uh, during when before he went in uh, PT boats and he was uh, went and made a speech uh, in uh, South Carolina and in the course of the speech it was right at the beginning of the war he was explaining to them what you do if a bomb falls and a fire starts and if the fire starts he said on one kind of fire you throw water on on the other kind of fire you throw sand on and if you throw uh, water on the one that just you throw sand on it'll be devastating because it'll spread the fire and so you have to be terribly terribly careful and he made the mistake at the end by saying, are there any questions? And somebody got up and said, well, how do you tell one fire from the other? And he said, there's a fellow coming next week who will explain that. <laughs> well, that's what I say to you. I don't know. <laughs> can, I just, uh, can I just thank you for t coming uh, today and uh, how much I appreciate it. I need to help in this uh, campaign. Could I just take just 30 seconds of your time?
bogs, and yet uh, all of the starvation and all of the suffering takes place all over the rest of the globe. Oh, excuse me. I'll be glad to answer. Now, I think it's a perfectly legitimate question. Would you like, you ask me some specific what you want to have, what I think we should be doing. You want me to tell you what I think I should do about the cities or what? The jobs? All right, I'll tell you about jobs. I thought I answered it. your ability to recognize the problems and you did do a good job of that. I don't, I don't mind. He's perfectly entitled to his point of view. He's perfectly entitled to express his point of view, and he's perfectly entitled to disagree with me. And it's the only way that we're going to make progress in this country if people stand up and speak their minds. So. Well, I suppose I can speak about what I think should be done about uh, all of these matters. I can speak about what I feel should be done about the cities. I can speak about what I think should be done about education. And I should also say that I've been speaking about these matters for uh, several years and talking about what I think needs to be done in this country and the kinds of programs that I think need to be developed, which I think would be effective and would be helpful. And I will continue to speak out on them. And, uh, and of course, any other candidate is free to express his point of view and his views on what he feels should be done as well. But I speak for myself. I don't speak for anybody else. This gentleman in there. Laws against what? Cannibalism. Cannibalism? You mean e eating your fellow human being? <laughs> of Dr. King's, did you know him personally? Uh, not personally, but I have been around where he was at a couple of so times. Now, why did you come out here? Well, I work out here, and so after you come out here, I come out here to see what was going on. I work right here at the airport every day. What is your personal reaction to the, to the death of Dr. King? Do you feel bitterness, sadness? How would you well, describe your feelings? I really feel sad about it because I hate to see him go. That's, my, that's the way I feel about it. What do you think is the reaction of the Negro community here in Memphis? Do you, do you think that they'll accept his death in the spirit of his life? Uh, in other words, do you think that they'll, they'll be satisfied to let things be? Well, uh, personally, I don't think so, because it's a great thing for him to go. I mean, it was really sad. Everybody hates him. Nobody's happy over him going. So it might be forgotten, and it might not. I put it that way. Let me just ask you a quick question. Did you know Dr. King personally? No, sir, I didn't know. Why did you come out here to see his, his final departure? I just come out here to look at him. I worked out here. That's when I come out here. What do you what do you feel about this? Do you feel sadness, bitterness? Sure do. Sure do. You feel bitter also? I feel bad about it. You know, feel sad about it. ask you a quick question. Did you know Dr. King personally? No, I did not. Why did you come out here this morning? Well, for one thing, my husband and I are working in civil rights, and uh, we are certainly interested in our people. We have five children, and we would like to see them grow up in this free country and uh, participate in everything like everybody else, and that is what we will continue to fight for, and that is why I had great admiration for Dr. King. And